Howdy, everyone. My name's Justin. I think I'm on the 7.30 slot. Everyone hear me and see me coming in, okay? Yes. Awesome. Thank you so much. Sorry? Um, so, topic of my discussion today is you've been duped. I've been duped. Uh, we've all been duped. Uh, I'd like to sort of do a quick overview of the psychology of influence and persuasion, uh, advertising and propaganda. Um, this has been obviously a, a very interesting topic as of late because as we're going through this sort of global pandemic experience altogether, uh, it's, it's absolutely certain that everyone's <laughs> spreading messages, seeing messages, relying on information from various sources. And um, I can't help but just wonder how many people are getting tripped up by uh, information that they're seeing in places that isn't actually helpful or necessarily for their best intentions in mind. Now, I am gonna set a quick ground rule that I will not tell you any particular conspiratorial picture narrative. I will not paint you a picture as to what is fake, what is real and so on. That's not actually why I'm here. Uh, I would just like to bring to your attention all of the different ways, or at least some of the different ways that we have been influenced and persuaded and propagandized and the techniques that they use at each one of these different levels. Uh, I don't actually have a particular personal definition for either influence or advertising or propaganda. It's all looking at the same human behavior uh, equation uh, at either the micro or the macro level, whether you're talking to someone interpersonally in communication or uh, you're propagandizing through mass media to an audience, it's working on all the same uh, neuro and psychological levers. So the goal is how do you get someone to do what you want them to do, say, or think? That's what I'll be discussing and how these techniques uh, have been used uh, uh, against us really uh, for more than a hundred years now. Um, so just introducing those topics, uh, I'm gonna start with saying that you've probably never heard of me. Uh, you've never seen me in an issue of the New York Times. You've never seen me post any information on any source of credibility, whether you want to follow, say, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, LA Times. You've not heard of me. Now, uh, one question some of you might have is why would he be just openly uh, ripping apart his credibility there by not having any of these credibility markers? Well, the truth is, is one, I'm expressing uh, openly and honestly a weakness of mine, which is uh, a lack of credible publications, uh, which is actually increasing your likeness of me and therefore increasing my authority as well on the topic. And in addition, there's also a little bit of an NLP, neuro linguistic programming trick going on here where our brain doesn't necessarily understand or keep track of opposites. So by telling you that I'm not on any of these different publication services, some of you will inadvertently forget and somehow remember uh, by accident that I am somehow associated with these uh, logos and, and uh, uh, places of credibility. <clears throat> it's kind of like saying, don't think about a gray elephant. Don't think about a gray elephant don't think about a gray elephant. Eventually someone in this room is gonna think about a gray elephant, even though I'm telling you not to. Our brain doesn't really interpret these opposites. If you don't believe me about these tricks and how they work, ask yourself this question. Why was the Netflix documentary on Tony Robbins, the you know world famous life coach and neuro-linguistic programming master, why was the documentary that, that Netflix released about him a couple of years ago called, I am not your guru? I think they understand something about NLP when they're naming their different series. Uh, <clears throat> so a little bit about my background, actually. I am a, I'm a freelance consultant on the topics of uh, communications, customer service primarily, but I've been working in uh, uh, mostly e-commerce, online marketing, management operations, logistics, IT around uh, retail spaces, e-commerce spaces. Uh, I've had a really fortunate, fun career uh, but actually, I don't actually have a, an IT background. My specialty, my, my bread and butter is actually influence and persuasive psychology. I studied uh, under the uh, very famous, and maybe some of you are, are familiar, Robert Cialdini. He wrote Influence Science and Practice. He was my professor when I studied psychology at Arizona State University, as well as other uh, colleagues of his, like Dr. Gregory Neidert, who works with him at Influence at Work. That really set the foundation for me to start to explore this, uh, uh, you know, education in depth, influence, persuasion. Now, if you're not familiar with Robert Cialdini's uh, 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 principles um, of influence and the psychology of persuasion, he, he outlines six basic principles that I'm not going to go into too much detail here. 
but you've probably observed them sometimes when you're watching ads on TV or on the internet, things like reciprocity, uh, consistency, uh, social proof, seeing other people like a post is gonna influence you to more likely like a post. Uh, liking uh, authority, if you see someone with uh, credibility markers, whether it be a doctor's lab coat, a gray suit, or say a, a, a diploma mounted on the wall, you're more likely to trust them and believe them as a source. Uh, and then classically, there's always scarcity, right? Uh, please hurry up now, this sale won't last long. Please buy, buy, buy. Uh, the same tactic used by some of those uh, shops you might see in a tourist town that just always seem to be going out of business every weekend whenever the summer crowd is in. That's scarcity. Now, the thing that I love about Robert Cialdini and his work was that he always overemphasized the importance of ethics and consent, especially in influence and persuasion. Some of you might be asking, how can you actually ethically persuade someone into doing something? Uh, it does not go against the very nature <laughs> of persuasion in the first place, which is sort of um, having someone shift their opinion or ideas without consent. The way to actually ethically achieve uh, reci uh, uh, reciprocity or, or consistency or social proof or any of these tools that uh, Cialdini talks about and, and others is to always look for the maximized win-win outcome, right? It's not about uh, gaining uh, an advantage over somebody so that you win and they lose, but it's always designing the situation and the exchange and the communication so that all parties win with maximum honesty and, and truth in the information. And when you do that, they actually find that uh, they have the most positive and most enduring long-term outcomes of uh, cooperation between people that are using these tactics and say their marketing or, or negotiations and things like that. Uh, that's just my background. I've been studying psychology ever since. It's just sort of the, what I nerd out to in my, in my daily reading. Um, but to dive in a little bit about my topic, how we've been duped for so long, let's look at sort of how all of this information, how this science of persuasion and propaganda and mass media came about. Social psychology isn't a new topic by any means. It's been studied uh, in uh, as early as the late 1800s. The actual first textbook on the topic of social psychology, how groups and people interact and behave and think together and influence each other. The first book came out in about 1908. Uh, it was it wasn't really codified as a as a science as a behavioral science um, until roughly the 40s and the 50s so if you think about it to, to borrow a joke from uh joe rogan that i saw recently on netflix is uh only two or three people ago you know only two or three generations ago two or three people ago set the stage for this science right um this isn't that new this is a this is a this is a new concept in the evolution of, of our species kind of thing. Even before it became codified as a, as a behavioral science in the 40s and 50s, there actually came a, a, a campaign prior to that that was uh, sort of the uh, groundbreaking uh, framework for all the advertising that we do today. Um, after World War I, uh, well, sorry, during World War I, uh, propagandist Edward Bernays, someone, uh, some of you might be familiar with that name. Uh, he was working to basically propagandize uh, American information against the, against the uh, Germans and other uh, combatants in the war and things like that. And um, after getting out of the war, what do you do with uh, the still set of influencing large bodies of people and populations? Well, he started a program called public relations. This was just another word really for propaganda, but Bernays got involved in advertising. That's where he went. After the war, the number one propagandist in the world, who's even looked up to by uh, Joseph Goebbels of, of Nazi Germany, World War II, who was their minister of propaganda. Um, you know, Bernays was sort of his, his idol uh, and, and laid a lot of the groundwork for them over there. Uh, he got into advertising. What, what else are you going to do if you're going to uh, study how to influence people? So after he basically completely flipped the script on cigarette ad, uh, or sorry, cigarette smoking campaigns here in the United States, uh, even convincing the entire female population essentially that smoking was cool because around the time that uh, women got liberated in the right to, uh, uh, or sorry, uh, I forget if it was the women's suffrage movement or so on. As rights came about, uh, Bernays and his team thought of the great idea that a uh, cigarette is a liberty stick and they were smoking to represent fee uh, freedom. And boy, did the, did the female population of the United States buy into it and it completely changed the game on the cigarette market. Along with several other campaigns like that, Bernays 
uh, was a master of his craft and basically set the stage for uh, the advertising that we know of today. Um, cultural historian Ann Douglas actually described him as the man who orchestrated the commercialization of culture. Okay, so really, we were not as much of a consumption driven culture in the United States prior to this study of advertising and public relations and propaganda and stuff like that. Uh, so I've, I'll be making the point uh, throughout that really this is a learned behavior. And I, I foresee this taking us down a, a, a dangerous uh, trajectory if we don't try to tr uh, a, a correct course today. Um, but after, after Edward Bernays set the stage for the, for the uh, uh, basics of advertising and things like that in the country, research in social psychology and in other spaces of psychology started to come out, especially after World War I. There was a lot of interest in how the psychology of war uh, takes a hold on societies and people and things like that. So there's a, a boatload of research. In fact, the majority of some of the most exciting research out of social psychology is on the topics of compliance and conformity and authority and things like that. You've got uh, the famous um, uh, Sharif and Ash line tests where they'd have people uh, arrange themselves in a, in a row and jokes on one out of the 10 people, the other nine were in on it the whole time, but they go down the line and they say, oh, I think that line is this long. I think that line is this long. And it's blatantly not what everyone uh, in the room is declaring it to be. It's much shorter. It's so obvious. And yet the last person, the actual uh, stooge in the experiment, after seeing nine other people say, obviously the wrong answer, what's the likelihood that that person's going to also say the wrong answer to fall in line and conform with everybody else? Uh, statistically, very significant, 70, 80%, something like that up there. Uh, a lot of people will just fall in line and conform. You've got Stanley Meldrum electrocuting people, telling everyone it's a learning experience, or sorry, a, a learning experiment, when really it's, a, it's a, 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 an experiment on an, on obedience to see if someone in a lab coat or some sort of authoritarian figure standing over your shoulder can convince you to uh, cause someone to be electrocuted to the point of non-responsiveness, non right? Then you've got Philip Zimbardo in the Stanford prison experiment uh, in the 70s where you have people dressing up as guards and prisoners and people just taking on these roles and just being all out nasty to each other. We've been looking at ways that people uh, fall into line, fall into order, do the things that we tell them to do for decades. And uh, <clears throat> paired with the advertising run that Edward Bernays set up, uh, you stat that on top of each other, and now advertising and marketing and mass media and things like that uh, are just getting that much more exciting. Um, so really, though, how is this affecting us? See, influence is a long game. Yes, there are moment to moment outcomes where I can actually influence a conversation in real time and get perhaps even you to say or do or think or move somewhere in the room that I would want you to. But in reality, it's the best influencers are stacking the deck over long periods of time. So that way, when you finally end up making the decision you thought to yourself you'd never make, you don't even know how you ended up there in the first place. And that's sort of how we came into this place that we are now, which is this sort of culture of consumption uh, for the last couple of decades. This is a learned behavior. The, the opportunistic approach to marketing and media is a learned behavior, and it's optimized for winning outcomes uh, that, that we learned and studied and ingrained in this research and this study uh, decades ago, right? If you think about it, um, the ideas of public relations and propaganda and marketing and advertising and the science around this stuff, its foundation is built on a wartime paradigm. These studies and things like that were done during World War I, immediately after World War I, during World War II, during the Cold War, during the Korean War. That's where so much of the most important social science has come from. And yet if our thinking in those states, uh, in, in those time periods is us versus them, win versus lose, me versus you know anyone else, I think that impacts our actual culture of marketing and advertising or propaganda and mass media and the things that we find acceptable. So um, how does this cultural foundation affect this science of marketing, the science of advertising and propaganda? Well, whether you learn about this material or not, it's being used against you, right? It's always has been. 
uh, everything you know about landing pages and sales funnels, anyone in marketing uh, who is familiar with these ideas, the predecessor to that was direct mail marketing campaigns, right? It all comes back to the foundations of copywriting, which has been studied for decades and eons, same back during, you know, Ed, uh, sorry, Edward Bernays writing to people about what they should be believing in and what nation they should be rooting for. Copywriting, the role of any, or sorry, the purpose of any one sentence is to get you to read the very next sentence. And that's it. That's every landing page. That's every webinar you've signed up for. That's every email you've ever read. Each sentence, its sole purpose is to get you to go to the next sentence. It makes a lot more sense if you think about it why there's so many blatantly ugly and disgusting and misleading headlines because they just want you to click on something. But the thing is, is that all this wasn't developed in a time where we had infinite access to the internet and articles and things like that in our pockets. You know, Ed, Edward Bernays, when he conceived of these ideas, he didn't imagine that within 50 years, this stuff would be so pervasive, right? So <clears throat> how else is this being used against us? Well, the, a, a powerful question in any, in, in any influence engineering setup is, is, is asking the question, compared to what? Okay, we are comparison making machines. Every decision we make, every perception we have of the environment around us is based on comparing what we see to what we have seen, heard, or experienced in the past. So when left to its own devices, we fill in that gap. We find something that solves the equation, fills in the pattern, and so on to make us have a confident decision in what we're doing compared to all the other alternatives that we can conceive of. Well, Influencers, persuaders, propagandists, advertisers, and marketers, all they're really doing is not even giving you the opportunity to compare uh, your experience to, to what you might naturally compare it to. Instead, they're filling in the gap for you saying, why don't you compare it to this? Okay, <clears throat> it's actually really easy to do. If, uh, if you have a really hard time selling Cadillacs to someone who's price sensitive, you don't knock the price down to try to convince them to buy it. You just try to also sell them a private jet right next to the Cadillac. Because if you buy the Cadillac, you're at least not paying $2 million for the private jet. All you're doing is spending 300,000 on the, on the Cadillac. It's all contextual, right? It's based on the circumstances. So I'm filling in the gap for you to say, well, is a Cadillac really that expensive? No, not compared to a private jet. And then actually your decisions become influenced by that, right? Rather than you asking yourself, how expensive is this Cadillac, really? So beyond this, it's just going deeper and deeper down this rabbit hole. There's neuropsychology, there's, uh, there's neuromarketing, there's now people researching and developing different sights, smells, tastes, memories, emotional responses and experiences in their products. People literally are wired up to 16 or 24 channel EEGs to watch the brain waves go across their brain as they're being exposed to different kinds of advertisements and things like that. This is a decision-making science and it's a multi-billion dollar industry uh, and research uh, area. And it's uh, inevitably it will be used against you and we can't outrun it at this point. It's, it's working that quickly. Um, so the likely scenario is actually two things. One, what most people are afraid of is this information being used against them, right? And on a basic level, it is things like, you know, the simple advertising and the marketing. That's the stuff that we see every day. It is happening around us all the time. Um, but the, the, there's, the, there's not as many malicious people doing this as, as you might think. What, what most often happens is that people are using it and they're not knowing that they're using it and they're not realizing what they're doing. And oftentimes they get the exact opposite effect of what they want or, or what they intended to get in the first place perfect example is the Werther effect, where the Werther effect is sort of uh, the, the foundation for, for, for copycat killings and things like that. But essentially, um, if I'm convinced that other people are doing the thing uh, or something that I want to do and it's getting publicly validated and uh, even uh, sometimes highlighted, I'm more likely to do that thing. It doesn't have to just have to do with killings. But if you've ever watched any uh, news station anchor after a school shooting in the United States and they bring on a psychologist, they always ask the question, uh, what can we do to prevent these school shootings in the future? And any psychologist worth, worth their weight or gold says, stop publicizing the shooting, right? Don't make this a heroic story of someone, you know, get, you know having this tragic experience on all of these victims and things like that. That literally perpetuates the very behavior that we don't want to have happen. And yet 
if it bleeds, then it reads. That's the MO of all mass media. And it's actually uh, uh, doing the exact opposite of what anyone would want, which is more violence and, and, and more uh, destruction. So this is running rampant around us all the time. Um, in the last decade, though, it's finally come up this conversation about consent, right? We have people like Tristan Harris, who was the former chief ethics officer of Facebook, coming up with the organization Time Well Spent, because there are finally developers and engineers uh, that are looking at the things that we're doing with our technology, the, the announcements, the attention getters, the boops and the buttons and the things that distract us all the time. There's finally people saying and asking the question, do we really want to be behaving this way in relationship to our technology? And do we want these kinds of messages and dings prodding us constantly every day? I asked the same question about advertising and marketing in general, because think about it. When's the last time someone ever asked, hey, is it really consensual to try to convince you to do something that you don't know that you want to do in the first place, but I'm going to make it seem like it was your idea in the first place? Like, that's happening. That's happening to us. So um, <clears throat> it, what 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 results in this culture, what, what results with us is this, is this ever rampant consumption culture where uh, people are over consuming uh, both metaphorically and visibly in terms of either what they're putting in their own bodies or just what they're bringing into their own homes and things like that. And it's also the reason why we don't engage with anyone on the internet with any significant dialogue most of the times on social media, because everyone's just chasing after misinformation and looking in all these other directions. And people have forgotten how to actually have a conversation to pick apart and tweeze apart the truth and things like that. Um, or rather, not necessarily the truth, but what's the most helpful of the information. Uh, so it's very easy to just want to walk away from those conversations and be like, those people are dullards, they're just sheeple, they're... they're they're just gonna, you know, waste my time. It's not worth it and things like that. Well, the truth is, is that if we don't intervene, if you don't intervene, they're just gonna continue with that same path of influence. And they're that much more likely to influence somebody else to think the same thing that they do. And the truth is, is that we do actually know how to change people's beliefs, ideas, and opinions. It's been used against us many times throughout history uh, and in marketing and in media and things like that. We know how to get people to believe things that they don't originally believe. Perfect example is uh, during the Korean War, there was a huge concern by the US that uh, we were going to uh, have our soldiers brainwashed by the Chinese communists and things like that. So what they did to mitigate that uh, was actually instituted uh, like uh, Americanism and patriotism and, and, and uh, uh, excitement and camaraderie into the agendas and the courses at schools and things like that and, and, and in military boot camp. Turns out, though, that that didn't work for <laughs> all of the techniques that the Koreans tried on the POWs, uh, uh, sorry, on the POWs to, to get them to defect and uh, start actually agreeing with the, the, the leadership of Korea versus the United States. All they had to do was convince them to write a couple of essays about how cool Korea was in exchange for a couple of packs of cigarettes. Well, it might not seem like a lot, but one essay later, five essays later, 10 essays later, all of a sudden, it's really easy to write about how cool Korea is, even though you're still a POW in their internment camp. So we know how to change people's behavior. That's just one of the techniques. Uh, it's, it's not unreasonable to want to approach some of these conversations online and actually try to turn the tide. Because if we aren't willing to have a dialogue, at the very least, at the very least, if, 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 if we're willing to have a dialogue and they're not, it is a demonstration to everybody else on, on that space that a dialogue is open and that uh, the person who we're trying to convince into new ideas is just that repelled by the idea of having their, their mind or opinion changed. That's a good thing to show other people as a, as a form of social proof that, hey, we can still be, have civil dialogue here in a public space, even on social media. I think that can become a little bit of a fulfilling prophecy for actually getting uh, healthier conversations going. We just have to have more of them. Uh, so where do we go from here? Um, this is our global society's chosen operating system when it comes to marketing, advertising, and mass media and things like that. The further we go down this branch of thinking and research and study, the harder it's going to become to change. So <clears throat> what can we actually do? Well, if you believe this stuff exists, um, and even if you identify 
uh, with some of it, and you even may pick out aspects of propaganda or fake news or advertising that you dislike, and maybe even call it into question or point out, uh, point that out to people. It's easy to think that this stuff does doesn't affect you, but in reality, it always affects you. This stuff is a death by a thousand paper cuts. It's the long game. At some point, you're going to be caught off guard and you're going to have your executive co uh, cognitive faculties offline because you're tired, you're stressed out, you're sick, uh, you haven't been eating well, uh, and maybe even you're old. And you're just that much more easily uh, persuadable because you can't literally problem solve your way uh, uh, through the propaganda, through the influence. Um, my goal is really to have people get stronger defenses around this stuff. And, the, and what's worked for me is actually learning a little bit more about it and the different techniques. Uh, I wanna call into question the ethical implications of the way that we're using advertising and marketing and business communications, because why can't we call that into question, right? There's, there's a, a complete uh, 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 restructuring of consent culture nowadays in our generation in this time. So if we're asking the question, what really does consent mean? If it's not a, if it's not a, an enthusiastic hell yeah, then it's a no. Why can't we ask ourselves the question, um, what's the consent culture like around marketing? What's the consent uh, culture like around advertising? Do we just want to let people run rampant? Because the truth is, is they're studying our brains and our decision making a lot faster than we are. And if we don't actually intervene, uh, this really is just going to go off the rails. Um, I'll wrap it really quick uh, with an actual quote from Edward Bernays. Uh, at the age of 100, before he died, he was interviewed. And he's quoted as saying, sometimes it seems... Okay, sorry, that is distracting as I'm trying to wrap up my talk on the final quote. Uh, sometimes it seems sort of like having discovered a medicine to cure a disease and then finding out that so much of it is being administered that people are getting sick from the overdose. That's the situation we're in with the science of marketing and persuasion and advertising and propaganda and things like that. We're getting sick from the overdose of having it at our fingertips 24 seven. Um, if you're interested in this conversation and you wanna learn more or you wanna reach out to me, I am uh, working on curating a space to get more thorough information about each of these different uh, ideas, uh, historical references to propaganda, advertising, like where this information comes from, what's the research behind it. I am piecing together uh, a nice space for that in hopes of just educating people on what to watch out for so that we stop getting duped. If you'd like to learn more about it, uh, please visit the website. Uh -huh, this is a sales funnel, sorry, propaganda.town. That's P-R-O-P-A-G-A-N-D-A dot town, T-O-W-N. You can also do propagandatown.com. Uh, I've got a really simple sign-up form there. Just want to know if there's interest here and what I should be working on next for you guys. Uh, we've got three minutes. If anyone would like to ask a question, I'm happy to answer and uh, riff on anything related to psychology, persuasion, influence, marketing, advertising, and so on. If no, that's totally cool too. Justin, just want to say that was a that was an epic session, and uh, I'm I'm uh, sending you questions personally. I think it's because there's just two minutes left. Some people may not be asking you questions. I've just pinged you on Telegram. Certainly, bless you. Th uh, th uh, yeah, thank you very much, Samir. Uh, look forward to catching up with you. Um, yeah, if anyone would like to reach out, um, you can find me on Telegram, Justin Dudek, or WhatsApp, Justin Dudek, or if you want to sign up and see what I release next on this Propaganda Town. Uh, bless you all. Have a uh, wonderful rest of the unconference and stay safe during these crazy times that we're living in. Cheers. <laughs>